right for our next venture back into looking at reviews that I'm not happy with that we did in the past. Now it's not just one specific movie I want to talk about, but more so a type of movie, which obviously is the journalism movie. And there's a few reasons that I feel like I haven't really done these movies justice as far as talking about them. One thing I can tell you now without even having to show you is um, there's a moment, and I, th I think it's at the end of the video I did for the post, where I kind of not correctly say that journalism movies just aren't really my thing and I'm not really that into them. That's not really what it is. The way these movies work are you're basically being given constant information and that's basically what the whole where the whole vibe of the movie comes from and where all the thrills of it come from. So just being told something is basically any sort of big, like, but take the place of any sort of big action scene, if you're talking about an action movie or something like that. And, and we see that in a lot of these, like, uh, the moments in Spotlight, when they're on the phone with Richard Jenkins, who's just a disembodied voice on the phone the whole movie. And they're talking about, you know, the number of priests in Boston, whether it's like 11 or 13. And then he just kind of says, oh, it's, my, it's probably closer to 90. And it's like just somebody saying a piece of information like that is what are, are the really big turning points in these movies and the really big, like, just gut punches and the things that just hit the hardest in these movies. And if you're not completely drawn in on that and it, you're not completely sucked in, it's probably just not going to have that feel, so typically I have to see journalism movies multiple times before they really start to hit. Because you're just kind of getting so much information, unless you know, like, the entire background of what's going on. Like, a journalism movie that I kind of loved right away was She Said, but that's because I, I had just read the book and I had watched all of that unfold, like, in real life. So I basically knew everything going in, I was able to just sort of watch it unfold as the movie was telling it. Um, and obviously here, while this is, some of this is, you know, recent history, some not so recent history, and, you know, certain parts that we know will happen, um, there's always going to be these intricacies that you really have to watch and pay attention to as everything sort of builds up. We can start with, uh, Spotlight. I, I felt like there had to be something I was maybe missing because I was very sort of lukewarm and, like, low energy towards it, but, um... In my defense, at the start of the video, there might be one sort of defense that I have as far as uh, why this video would be so low energy. I have been shooting videos now for the past six and a half hours, and this is the last one. I'm hoping that doesn't show. It did show. It showed quite a bit, actually, unfortunately. So, on top of that also, there was also this really glaring distraction. Spotlight was a difficult movie to walk into because it's long into award season now. Right. And it gets to that point to where you start going to movies that have a lot of hype behind them and possibly some award wins already. And this was that time of year where we walked into the movie. We pretty much know by this point it's the best picture for Runner. You really, really try your hardest to just... Just watch it. But when you're this far into award season and this kind of talk is going down, sadly, it's a kind of, it's in any other context, it'd be a really small, unassuming movie. But it's a whole other monster when you're trying to get out of your head how much damn hype is behind it. Pretty much every time this happens, the movie ends up being underwhelming through no fault of its own. Yeah, I'm going to assume that's just one of those annoying things. And you would think we'd be far along, far along enough now into this whole review thing that that wouldn't be a problem. But it, I feel like that's just always going to be an issue. Um, but like I said, through no fault of its own. And also, as far as it being... Uh, an unassuming movie. It's the the idea of the power of this movie would probably stand on its own with awards possibilities being an afterthought if it wasn't like right in the midst of award season. Like if it had come out in like the summer or before that or something, or before people even really knew what it was. Um, I can imagine it just having the. It'd be one of those movies that you would hope would get, you know, awards possibilities after the fact. Um, so when. <laughs> When it when you go in and it's already the front runner and obviously it eventually did win, um, that's kind of this whole other thing where you're like it's just kind of constantly in your mind like uh, 
like I I'm watching Spotlight right now after all the hype and that's one of those cases where I was talking about because it's a movie where you're getting constant information and those tiny little details make all the difference that's really not the mindset you want to go into with this so it it did feel like especially when I saw it like again it was like oh man I don't remember hearing this development at all or anything like that it's because just in my mind I was just repeating over and over again okay, it's Spotlight, this is the front runner. here we go, let's see what the big deal is, and it's like, you, you just really can't do that. And there's also, like, the checklist, where it's like, you know, uh, Michael Keaton had buzz, Ruffalo had buzz, Rachel McAdams had buzz, um, and Ruffalo and McAdams ended up getting nominated, and so you're just kind of constantly looking for those performances, and it's like, is that going to be worthy of getting nominated or not? And it's just, it's just all the stuff that you shouldn't be paying attention to. Um, and like I said, I, I would have loved to have seen this for the first time, before all the hype, before people really knew it was going to be this huge breakout. Um, but that's the way it was. But like I said, now that we've caught back up to it, or I've caught back up to it, and can see it for what it actually is, uh, that that makes just so much difference. McCarthy apparently um, has no bones about telling people, just shouting from the rooftops, um, I totally was thinking about all the president's men when I made this movie. <laughs> yeah, that's something you'll notice about this and the post, where I was really hung up on all the president's men and comparing them, and about how, you know, they were really trying to just have that vibe to it. But these days, it feels less like that, like I'm trying to compete them against, all against each other, and more like how they all kind of tell this sort of in-succession story, where it sort of starts, it starts with the post, then it's all the president's men, and then this afterwards. And they just make this really great trilogy together, and that's something that's always been satisfying about these movies now, um, that I've been able to just kind of s stop trying to see the, you know, similarities as far as the filmmaking and the inspiration and stuff like that goes. I don't, I don't think it's perfect by any means. There's a lot it expects you to keep up with, and it kind of moves fast, but at the same time, um, it's not always as gripping as it is at times there are there are some stretches where it just kind of feels like sometimes it kind of felt like we weren't really getting anywhere it's almost two hours and ten minutes that's pretty long yeah my feelings on the pacing and how gripping it is have just completely reversed from this and i think one section of the movie in in particular is probably what i was thinking of when i had that complaint which was when Ruffalo's trying to get those files where Stanley Tucci has to, you know, make them public and they have to go through that process. Then once they're public, he has to come all the way back and then he has to try to get them and then he's too late and he, like, has to go back to get them and then he has to, to like, uh, copy them and then that becomes the whole process. And, like, it feels like a big section of the movie, but that's the thing is... The fact that it feels like they're kind of not getting anywhere is kind of the point. Like, they would get stuck in these obstacles, and that's what, you know, the beauty of the movie is, and where the riveting portions of the movie are, are trying to see how they get out of these ruts. And this, like I said, this whole section with Ruffalo is, as far as the pacing goes, once you get, like, caught up in it, you don't realize how much time it's taking. You're just kind of going step by step, like, oh, this is an obstacle, and oh, this is an obstacle, and you kind of see him take the steps to get out of it and get closer to what the goal is. And by that point, a lot of time has passed without you even really realizing it when you're actually caught up in it, which makes the pacing pretty stellar and really spot on. And the editing is going to play a big part in this also, um, which is something I don't even think I talked about before. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of the point of the movie that sometimes they get stuck. But, yeah, that's that's when it starts to get really exciting is when they start, you know, getting over those obstacles. So that's, my, my opinion is just completely changed on that front. But that, that's the thing though, is you can probably call it out and say that, um, this movie is not exactly subtle with its points. Um, and s subtlety is typically something that McCarthy is like, that's like a specialty of his. But while this, this movie does have a lot of subtlety in it, don't get the wrong idea. It's just, um, there's also a lot of stuff that's not subtle, but at the same time, uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with what's going on in this movie. The whole idea is to be out in the open and make sure everything is on display. Yeah, once you've seen the movie multiple times, you'll definitely notice there's a lot more subtlety, certainly a lot more subtlety than I'm giving it credit for here. Um, so one of the things I was talking about there as far as it being uh, not subtle on purpose, where it's kind of out in the open, um, and how that kind of reflects that, it's this moment when um, Rachel McAdams is talking to the priest or the former priest 
and the guy is just sort of straight up confessing to her before his sister comes in and pulls him away. But the thing about this where that's where it talks about the subtlety and the not so subtle is that yeah it's it's out in the open and that's you know not subtle in a way that the story's trying to tell and reflects that well but what what I feel like is kind of subtle about it is that the scene ends with the priest saying you know well yeah cuz it happened to me and that's why he just thinks it's normal um and that's like this really big revelation but the way that that's subtle is that that's never really brought up again explicitly, but it's there because it's the idea of, um, when we see Rachel McAdams telling Keaton about it later, she sa all she says is he was just talking about it like it was normal, like, he, like it's a thing you're supposed to do or something. And what, they, what goes unsaid there, but the movie is still conveying, is that it's that cycle where the abused will become abusers. So the, the, it amps up the goal more where it's, it's always, the goal has always been to just stop this from happening. But now after that scene with McAdams, it basically sets up that if we can stop it from happening, we can stop the cycle itself of it continuing in that way also where, a, where the abused become abusers and that whole thing. And so I like that it just does that without even really saying it explicitly, but you get that vibe that the stakes are higher now a little bit just because of this one reveal that she doesn't even really mention to him, but it's it becomes a real, a real driving force. And then there's moments where I talked about um, where the survivors are being interviewed and like behind them you'll see churches where churches are just everywhere and churches are behind playgrounds. Joe even mentions that explicitly at one point. Um, but the great thing about this also is there's one moment that really sets up the sense of community that was a detail that just goes by so quickly. I didn't notice it for a long time. And that's when, um, Mike, I think he's in a cab at one point or, where Mike's just going somewhere. And while Mike's in this car, it drives by a playground and we linger for a second and it's Patrick pushing his kid on a swing and it just kind of goes by, and and the thing about that is it kind of setting up this sense of community where it's like, when, as we've already seen the Patrick interview, so we already know who he is at this point, so while we're watching the movie and we just kind of see him in this passing moment where he's like, you know, in the background of a scene, um, where we say like, you know, oh, I know that guy, um, and it's like, oh, I remember him from that scene, and as far as that setting up the community, it's, it's like, it's basically like anybody you pass by at any given time could be a survivor or a predator. And I like the way that that little scene just kind of sets that up. And it's, it basically sets the, it, it's the whole setting of Boston itself in the movie where every time we see anybody, suddenly it's like, you know, one could be either one. And that's, as far as setting up the world and that feeling, that very real feeling of it could be anybody one way or the other. Um, is really powerful. One of the important things that happens early in this movie is Rachel McAdams talking to one of the victims and interviewing them. But McAdams just straightforward says, we can't sanitize this, and we have to just say everything and absolutely every detail so people know just how bad this is. And that basically not only speaks for that situation, but for the movie itself. There are these scenes in this movie. Now, people like to say it's a movie without showy scenes, but there are certainly scenes that hit you like a big showy scene would. Particularly these scenes where these victims have to describe what happened to them. All these people are actors. But it's kind of, as you can see, just as I say this just now, that's kind of hard to distinguish. The real, the key performances in this movie are the people playing the victims. Yeah, one correction, obviously, to make there is um, repeatedly referring to them as victims. And while that certainly is the case, it does seem like it's more, it seems much more helpful when you refer to them as survivors, and that's kind of something that becomes a theme throughout the movie. So um, I would change that. And yeah, talking about those performances, still even now, um, watching these performances from, like, uh, Michael, Michael Cyril Creighton and Jimmy LeBlanc, who played Joe and Patrick, um, and the, the Snap guy also, it's, it's still crazy to this day how real those performances are and how hard it is to believe that they're actors. Um, especially with Creighton, where we've seen him, we've seen him in a lot of comedies now, like, he pops up in, like, the opening scene of Game Night, and he was on, uh, Only Murders on the Building, 
and he was he was even one of the reporters in um, the post and his his big scenes kind of comedic in its own way um, and when I would see him in those other movies I didn't even recognize him as Joe from Spotlight and it, I mean it could be the beard and glasses but also just the performance itself and how it's so real I guess I had to really I think I had to look up after the movie to make sure they weren't they didn't put actual survivors in the movie because those scenes are that convincing. And Jimmy LeBlanc especially who I looked up and I don't even think he's like really an actor. Like he has a few roles, he's done a few roles, but it's almost like it's kind of a side thing for him by the looks of it. And and that's just wild to me how real these scenes feel because those are the real sort of core of the movie and the heart of the movie. And what really drive the movie emotionally is getting their stories and it, that really sets the groundwork. Um, like there's a, like to, to jump to the post real quick, um, the opening scene of the post does show us, you know, like the Vietnam War and we see like a battle scene and all that. And it's like the reason that's necessary is to kind of show us what exactly we're dealing with and why these documents are so important and getting the story out is so important. And with that, we actually, like, see what's going on. Here, it's all about just them telling us the details. And it's those moments alone that drive this emotionally and really bring, like, like when everything gets to, like, the close and we get those moments when all the phones are going off, and it's like the power of that is that we're knowing we're getting those scenes, the Joe scenes and the Patrick scenes, just over and over and over and over again as each phone is going off. And like each phone going off is a Joe or a Patrick and what happened there. Could, and it could even be worse maybe than Joe and Patrick's stories. It's hard to tell. Um, but just the varying degrees of it, it, it doesn't matter. It's just, it has that power. And then when we get to the end and we see like, you know, all of the locations and imagine all the different cases that are in just one place, let alone all the ones we see. Um, and it's just, it, it's a really sobering experience, like every time you watch it. Like I've, I've seen Spot like numerous times now and every time it gets to that ending, or even if it gets to the interview scenes or whatever, um, the power is just always there. And it's like, even if, even if it didn't, it wasn't like an, a directly true story, there would still be some power to it, but I, obviously it's certainly a part of the, uh, that this isn't just, you know, in this particular time, but that it's ongoing still now and still being covered up in places that we don't know about. Um, it's just this really, yeah, just this hugely emotional experience, and that's, yeah, like I said, we I just wasn't giving it that credit because there's it it, it it is so much to take in but like i said you also have to really be um looking at the details of it particularly in journalism movies in general um but with this having the emotional impact of what the story is and who is telling these stories um is a whole other thing and it's really easy to see this wasn't one of those cases of oh it won best picture because it was the important movie of the year um, because the Reven we were talking about it being the front runner. The Revenant got really, really close at the end there. Um, but it's very easy to see why this would take it, not just for the important factor, but because of just how emotionally it hits and how much it really tells its story with such integrity and gives the people involved such integrity also, um, is just, it it's such a, per it might be a perfect movie, honestly. And, and the fact that it seems to have carried that respect that it's gotten as it's gone on, because winning Best Picture can kind of hurt your reputation, because everybody immediately comes in knives out. Everybody wants to see, oh, what's so perfect about this? And as far as I know, pretty much everybody comes out of Spotlight going, yeah, that's that was probably the best movie of that year. <laughs> um, and so, and, and I'm not, I don't even remember if it made my top ten at the time, but it certainly would now. It'd certainly probably make my top five at this point. Um, it get, and it really is uh, that great, and it really is that powerful, and I love that pretty much anybody that sought it out has pretty much agreed with the Academy's decision. So uh, that's where I stand with Spotlight now. So um, I guess we can move on to uh, The Post, which ran into some similar problems there at the start. You kind of risk the whole, um, the, the whole Oscar bait thing, where you have... A Spielberg movie starring Hanks and Streep, and it's about journalistic integrity, and 
the Vietnam War and all that stuff. Yeah, so I talked about Spotlight being what probably would have been an unassuming movie when it first came out um, if it didn't already have the hype behind it. This is pretty much the opposite of unassuming. It's As soon as it's announced, it's a Spielberg movie about journalism and the Vietnam War starring Hanks and Streep. Um, that's just immediately going to get bombarded with hype and awards talk and stuff like that. And so, really, it feels like it kind of had a bigger obstacle to get over because this was fr from the mere announcement of this movie that hype was setting in and the awards talk was setting in and all that. So, this was definitely something that was probably always going to seem underwhelming because, like, like I was talking about with journalism movies, where the big factors of it, and if, if, it's a, if it's a really good journalism movie, the big factors will just be these moments that are kind of low-key in general. Um, so, this was probably always going to be underwhelming, in quotes, to a lot of people. Um, but there's definitely... Um, as soon as I watched this movie again, before the award season was even over, uh, where I was kind of catching up on, I usually like a week before the ceremony, I'll catch up on all the Best Picture nominees that I can, and it, it was really just one rewatch of the post, and it was like, oh, I, can, yeah, I completely read this movie wrong, um, and it's a lot better than I was giving it credit for, because I was much harder on this than I was on Spotlight, and uh, that just doesn't really add up to me now. Now, I think an another problem with that also is, um, I don't know what was going on with me in this video. It was really, really hard to watch back, harder than usual to watch yourself. Um, because apparently, I seem, like, really, really nervous about talking about this movie, and there's, like, a lot of pauses, and I think that's also just part of talking about a movie that had so much hype behind it at its announcement, let alone the fact that I had just seen it, like, three minutes before that video started. So, yeah, there, so I was kind of all over the place on this one, and uh, we can start to look into that. So let's start with what I said about Streep. One thing I had heard going in was that she was surprisingly understated throughout it. Like, we're getting, like, full understated Streep. And, I mean, I mean, the, I mean obviously, the Streep is still in there. I mean, there's going to be those scenes that are just made to be Oscar clips uh, sprinkled throughout uh, and yeah, that whole kind of determined character arc thing. Um, but she does sell it in a way to where she doesn't really have to do anything particularly big as we would often expect from her. And she handles the understated just as much as the clearly supposed to be powerful moments, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's a pretty simplified way to put it, I guess. Um, but I still don't feel like I was giving her a lot of credit. As the, as the season went on, after I'd seen it that second time, I was definitely... Uh, championing her in a way where when you talk about her being really understated for a long time and then getting the big scenes where I wouldn't just describe them as supposed to be powerful they are powerful and a lot of that is because she spends a lot of her performance earning those big moments because this is a character where her whole arc is essentially getting walked all over by Tracy Letts and Bradley Whitford amongst others and how they're basically She's basically there to do what they think she should do. Um, because, you know, it, it was her father's paper, and then it was her husband's, and now it's like, people are basically trying to keep it a guy's paper of sorts. Like, they're, they're doing everything they can to make sure they're in control of it, um, and she's just sort of the, you know, thing they have to get over in order to get there. Um, and they speak for her, and... So when that seems like it's happening throughout, but it, she's gradually, in each scene, getting farther and farther away from that and getting to making her own decisions and realizing that she's the one in power and trying to make others realize she's the one in power. And so when we get to these moments at the end where she decides that she's going to publish or she goes against Tracy Lutz, and the way the camera like just sort of slowly pushes in on her as we can start to see her come into this final conclusion of, well, I don't really have to do what they say, and I can make my own decisions and what I think is right. And just because, you know, Tracy Lett says don't do it, that doesn't mean that that's the way it has to be. I can go against him. I can make this decision for myself. And you see all of this happen in this few seconds where the camera pushes in on her. And then it's just this massive turning point for the character. From then on, we get these moments when she has the moment with Alison Brie, which I mentioned, um, where she talks about, she does the dog walking on hind, leg, on hind legs quote, 
and talks about how much she loves the paper and just these scenes that just ooze what this character really is and it's like this is the first time we're really seeing who this person is and she had to break through this barrier that others had set up in front of her in order to do this and like I said she had to get to that point to where she earned these scenes and I feel like she did that perfectly the scene where she stands up to Bradley Whitford um, and people were, you know, turning their nose up at her getting nominated for this because she gets nominated for, in quotes, everything. Um, but it's, once it set in, it was like, I was really pulling for her to get nominated for this, and I'm really glad that she did it because it was definitely an earned nomination. And it's also funny that this was 2017, um, and, like, that running joke where, like, oh, Meryl Streep gets nominated for everything, I don't think anybody really realizes, because nobody's really mentioned it, she hasn't been nominated since this movie. And that's been, like, six years now. Um, so that's, so it's especially, when you look at it from that instance, um, where it's her last one in a while, by Streep standards, um, I just, I really love her nomination for this and her performance in this. So I, I was completely behind that. And then we have uh, Hanks. It's, it, we all know the part that he's playing. And the issue here is that his entire performance from beginning to end is basically just an impression of Jason Robards. Yeah, that's me getting hung up on all the President's Men again, and because for some reason that's pretty much all I said about Hanks. Um, when there's, there's a lot more to that where it's like, yeah, he does have those moments where he's, it seems like he's doing Jason Robards and all the President's Men because he's playing the same character. But the thing about it is there's also these human moments that for some reason I wasn't acknowledging that happened throughout. Um, like when he has like the purple ball and stuff like that, and when he has these moments of unease, um, where you can see the guy behind the job, um, and it's like, and, and the lemonade stuff also, uh, where you can actually see a real human being in here with actual real feelings and emotions, where he has, he has that great moment where he tells the story of how Jackie Kennedy like broke his heart because he thought he was kind of in with Kennedy as a friend and then it's like, oh, you might be using us for a source is what they were thinking. Um, and how much that, like, genuinely hurt him because there is this humanity in him that people might not see because he's so driven by his job and driven by the news and all that. Um, but like I said, we get these moments where we see just as much unease and uncertainty in him in this as we do him having full confidence in the face of adversity and how he has those sort of leadership qualities. And I've, Hanks really just brought all that um, to his performance, and it's it's much more layered than I was giving credit for, and it might seem on the surface. Um, I don't know. It's all it's all it's also pretty out there um, as far as what you can see. Um, so as far as you know the the unease and the uncertainty and the confidence and the leader. So yeah, there's plenty going on in this performance that I wasn't giving it credit for, and it and it's Hanks, so that's that's just a it's Hanks in a Spielberg movie, so um, that was just a weird way to approach that is to just get hung up on the Jason Robards thing. But the real standout, if you want to look at the cast, and this is a big cast, uh, the real standout in this movie by far is Bob Odenkirk. I would I would watch an entire movie with this guy doing this portion of the movie as the lead character, as, like, the whole story. Yeah, I can still stand behind saying that. Um, but I, do, I wouldn't say by far now, because what Stream and Hanks are doing also is really, really powerful. Um, but yeah, I would definitely watch a whole movie of Odenkirk's, Odenkirk's portion of the movie. Um, there's even the moment when, um, when we bring Matthew Reese in and they have that whole interaction. And Matthew Reese also is another character that I feel like could have his own movie, and I think he actually did. Um, where there was a 2003 movie, I think it was, called The Pentagon Papers, where James Spader played the character. Um, so that, so that does exist. That does show that that is possible also. Um, but I just like this especially because I think it helps now that I know that that is an actual movie. I haven't seen it, but I, I will seek it out. Um, I'll, I'll be curious if it's one of those ones that's more or less, um, you know, reliable to real life, but... Um, the idea of this movie kind of being all these stories at once, where we're getting Odenkirk's story and Matthew Reese's story, but we're also getting Streep's and Hank's, and we're getting everybody's perspective on what happened here, it does feel like a very complete movie as far as all the different characters that we're looking at um, as far as perspective goes. And it actually bounces around between those pretty well and pretty equally. Um, so, yeah, th this movie handles the characters a lot better than I was giving it credit for um, when I talked about this before.
And this is a point to where, like, a movie like Spotlight exceeds. Because a lot of the... Obviously, Spotlight had a lot of people in it. But um, they all kind of had... It, at least most of them, the most crucial ones, at least had one individual moment all to themselves. Um, and this movie is not really like that. It does feel like they take actors like Bradley Whitford or Tracy Letts um, or David Cross, and uh, they feel like they're kind of like there to fill in the blanks in the office scenes as opposed to really bring any particular... And it's nothing they're doing at all. Like, it's nothing they're doing or not doing. It's just that there's no particular strength to their material. They're just written to be here. And we have other people, like, um, there are a lot of throwaway roles, like, um, incredible actors like Sarah Paulson or Carrie Coon, uh, are basically more or less in the background. Alison Brie doesn't do jack shit in this. See, you'll notice there, uh, using Bradley Whitford and Tracy Lutz, they were probably the two worst examples I could have used, because they really play this massive part in Streep's arc, where they're the ones holding her back, and they have plenty of scenes, especially Bradley Whitford, of these scenes where she's being held back and it's showing the real obstacle that she had to get over in order to get her power and basically be in charge of the paper without them getting in her way. So they're, they're essentially antagonists of sorts, uh, Whitford more so than uh, Let's. But the thing about that also is we're dealing with uh, composite characters at times, I imagine. Um, so when I was talking about having characters that are just kind of in the background or just kind of here. A lot of those are real people. Like, David Cross's character is a real person. Um, and when you look at composite characters, that means that we've taken multiple characters and put them into one. So if anything, this movie has less characters than it could. Um, so, I, and I do think they spread that out. As far as, like, you know, other people. I mentioned Carrie Coon not really getting a moment. Um, she absolutely gets a moment at the end. She gets the whole... She gets to announce the big sort of uh, decision that's been made by the court, and she gets interrupted by that guy, but then she gets to say, like, why the court made his decision. It's a really big moment that she gets to herself, so I don't even know why I mentioned her and threw her into that whole thing of um, the characters not getting their own individual moments. Um, there are some cases where it, it is true, like Sarah Paulson and Alison Brie don't really get anything at all. Especially Paulson. Paul, Sarah Paulson's like third credited. Um, but she is the sort of throwaway wife role that we see, and Alison Brie's kind of the throwaway daughter role. Um, and they're basically just there so that Hanks has somebody that he can monologue to, and Streep has somebody she can monologue to. It's pretty much why they're there. So... As I do kind of stand by making those characters recognizable actors can be a bit distracting. Or if it was just some character actor that we're not as familiar with, where we don't see somebody's face and immediately say, oh, that's whoever, um, then that probably would have been not as distracting. But as is, um, that's the case. But yeah, a lot of the characters here do have, you know, a purpose and stuff like that. Jesse Plemons, I don't think I even mentioned. Um, but there's definitely more than I was giving credit for as far as the side actors, but there's still those throwaway roles every now and then. The problem is, is like, is it gonna be, is this what the movie is? Is it gonna move this fast? Is it gonna be, like, constantly doing this and we're moving in one direction? And it kind of feels like a race against the clock, more or less, a lot on top of, you know, dodging obstacles and all that, potential jail time and all that. Um, not really. Not, like, all the time. <laughs> With these movies, you definitely have to have a certain flow. Like, that's what the movies are kind of, you know, all about. Kind of getting those things to where it kind of seems like this would more or less be a mundane thing, but they make it really exciting. Like, All the President's Men, like, make simple phone calls the most exciting thing ever. And it's like it fluctuates throughout the movie because it's like, one minute it's really rolling along and it's really, the pace is like really going steady and we're moving along nicely and you're getting us pulled in. And then there's like a stretch of like total blandness. Especially at the beginning, there's a lot, there's like a lot of bullshitting. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, pretty much all of that is wrong. So, <laughs> um, yeah, as far, I, I don't, okay, first of all, I honestly do not even remember what I saw as a bland stretch when I first saw this. And, like, even when I just saw it the second time, which was not long after this, 
Um, I'm not really sure what I'm talking about as far as there being bland stretches, unless there's something that had more importance than I thought it did on watching it the first time. Um, as far as the bullshitting goes, something I go on about for quite some time is the dinner scene at the beginning, and then how there's dialogue and then it's about, you know, Stroop being told what's going on. But the thing about this dinner scene is that it basically is the personification of what Stroop is going through and what her big obstacle is, where we have the guys and the women at the table, and then the women have to get up and leave and go to the other room while the guys have the conversation. And it's like, that's just everything about what the problem is here and everything about what Streep's sort of big obstacle is here that she has to get over. All these scenes that make it more powerful when we get to the bigger moments and Streep starts to sort of take control. And that's... Yeah, I, and I, don't, I don't know how I didn't see that before, but um, it's all here. Like, everything is working towards the scenes that are big emotional payoffs being big emotional payoffs. So, without all of this, we can't get the moment when the printers start up and the room shakes and we get that really... It's, it's a big moment in itself, but the big moments just keep happening. There's the moment where they're trying to figure out how bad their court case is going to be, and then Hanks comes in and lays down, like, every single paper that followed her lead, and then that point where Carrie Coon announces the decision by the court and all that. All of these scenes that have all these really satisfying moments and these really big emotional payoffs um, do not really come unless we see the adversity that Streep went through, and that's in, like, all these scenes, the Bruce Greenwood scenes, the Tracy Lutzen Bradley Whitford scenes, the dinner scene. All of that is setting up Streep's character, and that's where, like, the main perspective of the movie is coming from, despite it feeling like an ensemble piece, um, which we talked about it doing well also, but, yeah, that's where the real, just, core of everything is, so that's... That was just kind of, I feel like that was just a total misunderstanding of this movie uh, <laughs> the first time. So, like I said, that seems to mainly happen with journalism movies for me. It's not an occurrence that happens, like, you know, all the time, um, where I just completely don't get a movie right away. Um, like I said, it's these journalism movies where you're getting a lot of information at once, and there's some things where they might be subtle enough to where you don't realize the impact that they have on the story until you know the full story. So... That's why I try to pay extra close attention to journalism movies now, because they are they can make some of the best movies and some of the most powerful movies, and they do it in such sort of small ways, or not, not as loud ways. Um, and that's... Yeah, so I've really started growing to love uh, journalism movies as we go on. So I'll probably have to redo when I talk about All the President's Men also, because that, that did have a video a while back, and I don't even remember what I said in it, so it's probably a disaster too. Um, so do me a favor and don't go back to it. Um, and then maybe we'll talk about it later. So, um, that's how I feel about these now, and I really wish I'd been able to say this the first time, but, uh, we're saying it now, so hopefully something gets out there. Um, that doesn't make me look completely incompetent like this, uh, this video for the post especially. So, uh, I think that's gonna be it for this. So the next thing is going to be... We have the Oscar predictions tomorrow for September, and then a few more things in September, and then all of October, um, which is going to be super fun, I hope. So uh, until then, I think that's it.